sometimes in life, when I just need to reward myself with something, right, I'll stuff my face with either a slice of cake or like a cookie, you know, and I'm immediately brought to a land of sugar high, right? Now, imagine if I was someone running a baking business, I tell you, diabetes would be my middle name. And when you cut my veins, confirm chocolate fudge will come out. So let's talk to someone who is actually running a baking business. Let's see if, like me, she'll end up eating all the cakes herself. So welcome to another episode of Find The Real, where I believe everyone has a story. It doesn't matter if you're a policeman, it doesn't matter what your career is, what you do for a living. Everyone has an interesting story, and my role is to find those interesting stories for you, for your entertainment value, as well as for us to get some learning so that, you know, we can hopefully better our lives. And today we have Sabrina from Brina Breaks. How's it going? Hi, Emil. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, uh, you're most welcome. Thank you for it's coming. Yeah. Great. So what's interesting here is today we're going to talk a little bit about how, you know, you, Sabrina, who is a kindergarten teacher, mm-hmm. who is also running a home-based baking business called Brina Bakes. That's correct. Right? And then we're going to talk about how you balance both things and how is it like running your baking business, right? So in a nutshell, could you tell us a little bit about yourself first? How you grew up? What's your background? Okay, so well, basically I grew up in Ampang. So oh, for the Ampang, first, what's up, KL? That's right, shout out to all the Ampang. <laughs> uh, so yeah, basically the first few, uh, 18 years of my life, Ampang has been my playground. Mm-hmm. And you could say it, my uh, childhood was filled with sweet memories. Sweet as in sweet enough to bake a cake or... <laughs> yes, that's right. All right. But no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> it just came out. Huh? So yeah. so talking about growing up in Ampang, what, what were some of the key memories that you had growing up? You know, anything interesting that you could, uh, you know, share with us? Of course, a lot actually. Um, you know, Ampang back then, 30 years ago, uh, there were a lot of... We still had a lot of nature around us, okay. less development... So um, my parents would bring us out to all the nature attractions like mm. the waterfalls and the rivers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and and my dad is a guy who loves outdoors and mm-hmm. being in the nature. So it was mostly that. Okay. So do you still enjoy like nature stuff right now? Oh, of course I do. Okay. Sometimes um, pre MCO, me and my friends and husband would go out uh, for camping over the weekend and when, uh, when you say camping uh-huh. you mean the real camping or the fake glamping which what are you talking about the real deal okay, legit lah yeah like with tents and all we'll build up our tents okay, okay yeah but of course we'll find spots that are you know proper and a little bit clean the toilet has to be there it it has to have accessible toilets. I'm sorry. So, th- so that's not real camping for me. So back in the day, I was I was a boy scout. Okay. So my toilet was a hole in the ground. Oh, okay. No. So if you're a scout or you're a real camper, you know what I'm talking about. But still, I think glamping has just taken over, right? Everyone's just like, I'm just going to stay in a pre-built tent, you know, mm-hmm. with like, you know, my mm-hmm. running hot water. I mean, that's not camping for me. Lah. Yeah, I understand. But it, for me, like the camping style that we go for it's like in between. I wouldn't say glamping because we still build our own tent. Mm, it's mm, still mm. in the nature, mm. you know, on the ground. Um, just it has public toilets. I just got to have some toilets. Lah. Yeah, oh, right, that's I right. I can. So, so here you are, you know, spending 18 years in Ampang, growing up, um, you know, enjoying the outdoors. Mm-hmm. So before we go into the baking bit, how did early childhood education, you know, come into your life? Uh, okay. Interestingly enough, um, it didn't for uh, for the first few years of my life. Okay. I mean, even though I have some educators in my family, mm. my grandfather was a principal, my auntie was also a principal, but that never really played a role okay. in shaping me as an educator. And I remember um, when I was in my teens, one of my friends did ask, like, would you ever want kids? Mm. And I said, no. Yeah, surprisingly <laughs> enough. I know, I know. Looking back, it's like, wow, mm. well, how did I get here, you mm, know? Mm. So, yeah, I said I didn't want to and I never wanted to back then because, you know, as a child, 
myself mm -hmm. I knew how difficult it is to you know to, to handle kids and all their tantrums and whatnot and all their funny acts mm -hmm. but then um, for some reason it changed I guess you know as as you grow older your hormone changes you go through biological changes and stuff mm. and um, and at that time I had adopted a cat and that love for a child or that sense mm, of being mm, a mm. mother somehow develops through having a cat so to, yeah. to, to all aspiring parents out there right <laughs> this is the advice get a pet <laughs> yeah if you can manage a cat you should be able to manage kids <laughs> I guess so, in a sense, right? But yeah, I guess uh, it changed. Uh, life changed. Life happens. Mm -hmm. um, and funny enough, it was um, through a cat. And um, what else can I say? Oh, and um, of course, um, to all the t um, the teachers that I've had throughout my life, mm -hmm. you know, I've had some good ones. I've had some really great ones mm -hmm. that inspired mm -hmm. me. Um, to become who I am today. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I echo that. Um, personally, for me, I think growing up, teachers played a very big role in my life. You mm -hmm. know, teachers who were very supportive of my passion for music, um, you know, my passion for public speaking and things like that. So I, I really believe that teachers have a huge role in developing who you are That's as a true. person, right? So, so here you are through a cat. <laughs> finding out that hey, you have a love for you know children and so on and so forth then how did that translate to a career in education specifically early childhood mm, I guess I would say it's from um, it's sparked from you know the inspiration that I get also from my father because mm. I'm a very daddy's girl mm, mm, yeah mm. and then and, and watching him parent me uh. He had like a a really positive parenting approach, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, yeah, that inspired me a lot. Like he he would motivate me. He would use positive words, positive affirmations, and stuff like that. And uh, I also had a friend whose mother mm -hmm. um, was who owns a kindergarten ah, at the time yeah okay. and uh talking to her and watching her parent her children as well mm. also inspired me in that sense mm -hmm. so how did you continue your journey like did you go to did you learn um DECE like diploma in early childhood education you know did you did you get a degree in it or did you just learn on the job uh, as you moved on through your career okay so um, educational wise I actually did my diploma in um, in accounting oh okay yeah. okay yeah that's because my parents are both from the banking mm. background so my dad wanted somebody in the family to you know um, proceed with that career in life and mm. he thought that I could do it All right. <laughs> but I did tell my mom in the beginning I was like I think I want to try early childhood education okay but then my mom was like you know what because at that time uh, uh, we didn't really have a diploma or degree program in government universities uh, that carries out early childhood yeah. education yeah. yeah so we we had to like opt for private mm. colleges and mm. private universities mm. and you know private colleges they cost a bomb mm -hmm, so my mm -hmm. mom was like um why don't we just opt for the uh, government education mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then um and i applied and i got the diploma in accountancy and mm -hmm. she was like okay let's do that first mm -hmm. get your diploma mm -hmm. and then if you can do this if you finish your diploma then for a degree you can do whatever you like All and right. that being early childhood so that's what i did after my diploma after I finished my diploma, I applied for my degree in early childhood education at Management and Science University. Oh, MSU. Yeah. Batu Tiga, Shah Alam. Yes. That's where I used to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So you so you did your degree mm -hmm. uh, in early childhood education. 
um, you know, what did you learn? Like, like, what was it about doing that degree? Did, did that really help you uh, develop your teaching philosophies and things like that, you know? Oh, of course it did. Mm. Uh, it opened my eyes to a lot of things, like mm. all the parenting styles mm-hmm. that we've learned and all the different philosophies that actually shaped who I am as an educator today. Mm. And um, what else can I say? And also the practical, um, I guess the practical experience mm-hmm. that I went through as a mandatory uh, part to finish up my degree, yeah, that actually helped. So you finished your diploma in accounting, mm-hmm. right? Then you're like, you know what, I'm going to do what's really passionate for me. You did mm-hmm. your degree in early childhood education. Mm-hmm. So how did you end up, like, you know, how did you start your career? Like, did you then... F- you know, go through different schools. Did you go to your, you mentioned your friends, parents who had a kindergarten. Mm-hmm. So how did your career trajectory start from there? My first job was actually with um, Sparkles Montessori. Oh, I know Sparkles. Yeah. Uh, in Bukit Damansara. Mm. And that branch was owned by my husband's friend. Ah. Yeah. So it's like a mutual thing. And uh, they needed teachers so that was right after no wait, actually I was doing my practicum at that time yeah in sparkles uh, no I was still doing my I was waiting for my second practicum mm-hmm, yeah mm-hmm. so we have two practicums during mm-hmm. our degree mm-hmm. so I was waiting for my second one and then um, one day I got a call from the friend mm-hmm. and he said that his cousin needed uh, help uh, with looking for educators mm-hmm. and then he thought of me mm-hmm. And that's how it went. All right. So, h- any memories like the moment you got into that first job, right? So now you're moving away from um, practically learning, right? Mm-hmm. To real life being a teacher. Mm-hmm. Like any memories that stand out to you in those early days as an educator? I would say it's the first time ever being in a classroom handling all 20 children (laughs) yeah sorry and um you know not knowing because practicum and also real life Mm -hmm. is so much different because like uh, what you've learned during your degree or diploma it's all theoretical it's all in theory and Mm -hmm. then when you get into the real life like applying that theory is so different because then you have different situations going on because Mm. you have 20 children in a classroom one child could be you know listening to you uh, attentively and the uh, five other children at the back are like busy playing and stuff you know so you have a lot of things going on at the same time so Mm. you're like okay what do I do now you know with with the amount of experience that I have it's a bit hectic in the beginning of course but as I you know move on and transition it gets um, easier mm-hmm, and better mm-hmm. and more organized I would say yeah so you learn that through the job through experience course, right yes. organizing yourself and knowing how to manage these kids yes that's right. right so so when did you move to where you're currently working the children's house uh, it was actually so I was in sparkles for mm. only a month mm-hmm and then right after that I continued with my second practicum Mm -hmm. and uh, I finished up my degree Mm -hmm. and then right after I graduated Mm. um, a friend of mine actually recommended me uh, to work there Mm -hmm. because she was also working there at that time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I was like okay I've heard a lot of good things about the children's house it being a very you know um, premium preschool and stuff yeah, premium. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, where else better to start, right? Mm. My journeys. And so I applied and I got it. Mm-hmm. And I've been there ever since. Yeah. So how, how many years have you been in the children's house though? Nearly five years now. All right. So in the five years that you've been there, mm-hmm. uh, any key memories or interesting things uh, that has happened, you know, that you would like to share? Hmm, a lot actually um, the fact that the children there mm. are totally different mm. the group of children there they're much more mature I would say mm. 
and um, much more advanced, I would say, and much more loving as well. Mm. You know, mm. much more accepting. And uh, to compare from my previous job, the job scope is more. Mm. You've got more um, things to do, mm-hmm. and and the most important thing that has uh, that the children's house has taught me mm-hmm. is the safety and health of the children mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. our number one priority and that's what I I love about it yeah, yeah. so here's an interesting thing so my wife who happens <laughs> to be in the children's house uh, she's been there for 15 years uh, right. she started as a teacher and she's now a principal and I hear her stories every day right and for me hearing the stories of her children and when she talks about them there's this joy and sparkle in her eye right and mm-hmm. then that brings me to one question I don't, I don't know if you face this right but you tend to have attachment to these kids I, I don't know if it happens to you but just hearing this so then I'm like what happens when these kids like move to a different class or they leave the children's house like how, how like how do you manage those emotions you know I mean, in the beginning, it is tough. It mm. feels like a mother saying goodbye <laughs> I can imagine. to your own child. Mm. But after a while, you tend to get used to it because, you, you know, these children, they grow up mm. and they transition to different classes or they mm. move and leave you to different schools. They graduate, they go to big school. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, after a while, you get used to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, of course, it... It's never that easy, you know. I I still do feel sad um, when they leave. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard the stories. I mean, there are a lot of names in the 15 years I've been with my wife. Like, Mm -hmm. there are names that just stand up based on their stories and the (laughs) fact that we still talk about them, right? So I do I do see that attachment. So you you've taught all level of children. Like we're talking about from. infants to toddlers to preschool and things like that you've taught all levels yes i'm lucky enough to have experienced all levels of um the preschool and i'm currently in the preparatory class which is the kindergarten class basically okay so preparatory is just before we send them to um school right to big school right to the primary school yeah so amongst all these levels of students right Mm -hmm. what is the biggest challenge which group is the biggest challenge and why oh my god um actually all of them <laughs> they all have their own specific challenges all right all right um i'll start with the toddlers with the with the young ones they they need more attention and mm-hmm. more care because they're still so young still mm-hmm. so small mm-hmm. some of them are still crawling some of them are barely walking Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. properly so Mm -hmm. you have to be with them physically Mm -hmm. like Mm 24-7 basically right so that's the challenge of you know educating the young ones and then as you transition to an older class which is Mm -hmm. the nursery class Mm -hmm. uh, ranging from two and a half to three and a half um, the challenge with them is that you need to lean more into uh, it gets a little bit more academic with them uh, you know okay. introducing more things to them and then some of them are still some of them are still a little bit babyish so mm. you still have to have that um attention attention mm. to them and then as you transition to the older group four and a half to five um there's the focus on their academics mm. more focus on their academics because they're getting prep, uh, preparing them to preparatory class mm. and then in prep that's when they talk a lot that's when they start talking a lot and my son is in that age right now and <laughs> I totally understand <laughs> exactly. they're talking a lot boy when you yeah. watch this when you're older you talk a lot Mm. Yeah, and they have so many stories to tell you, so many things to say, and they will start complaining about their friends. Yeah, and they'll, and you'll get some children who are just overly active, <laughs> and you've got to watch out over for them and stuff like that. But yeah, all in, all in all, it has been fun. You know, every class has its challenge, and also its ups as well. I would say. You know, <coughs> just just hearing you talk. 
about your job mm-hmm. and about these kids, right? I I can really see the passion exuding from your paws, right? You <laughs> you love what you do. Can, can can I assume that that's true? That's true. Yeah, I I can see it. So so here you are, five years in the children's house, uh, totally enjoying what you're doing. And then at the same time, you kind of got a side hustle going on. You're doing Brina Bakes, right? That's right. So could you tell me a little bit about your baking journey? You know, how did you find your love for it? How did it start? Mm, as early as I can remember, I've always had a sweet tooth. Mm. Yeah, as early as I can remember. And I guess I want to say I got it from my mama. <laughs> 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 That's because um, when I was growing up, I remember that she would bake a lot she Uh would make a lot of desserts like malay desserts cakes and whatnot and i remember there was this one time she made this chocolate cake Mm. this moist chocolate cake for my i think it was like um you know during primary school you had this hari canteen yes 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 yes. yeah so i told her that was happening and she said okay let me bake something and she made this chocolate cake and the first time i had it it was like heaven on earth really and i think that was the first time ever that that made me like really fall in love with desserts with sweet food and then um funny enough when i asked my mom about the recipe i said mom do you remember this this happened and she was like oh i don't remember making it (laughs) and i'm like thanks mom (laughs) i'll never have that ever again so so are you currently on this quest of finding this Hari Kentin chocolate cake? Actually, yes. <laughs> how, how close have you gotten to your mom's secret recipe? Far. <laughs> Not close at all, really. Because I remember how it tasted, but at the same time, not specifically mm-hmm. but i just remember that it was so darn good and i shared it with the whole class and everybody loved it okay so so it started with your mother so mm-hmm. you you built this sweet tooth so mm-hmm. then how did that come along to you starting to want to bake yourself you know okay that started when um i first got introduced to mrs fields brownies actually yeah so thanks to my sister shout out mira <laughs> she uh because we were growing up in ampang right back mm. then and we were close to klcc mm. so we would go to klcc almost every weekend mm-hmm. with my sister she's much older than me so she could drive so she <laughs> would drive us to klcc and um she brought us over to mrs fields and at that time mrs fields was still around in malaysia mm. and they were selling brownies mm-hmm. um three pieces for if i'm not mistaken 10 ringgit at that time can you believe it all right three that's, that's premium yeah exactly that's premium. three pieces for 10 ringgit i don't mm. think you can get that anywhere here now mm. and 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 it was love at first sight mm. love at sorry love at first bite <laughs> that's actually our tagline for pun, Brina Bay. pun intended <laughs> love at first bite yeah. did, you, did you copyright that lot no because <laughs> it was literally it you know love at first bite and i was like dang i gotta you know i i and, and then afterwards afterwards uh, mrs fields exited mm. malaysia and i was like where am i gonna get mm. you know this as the brownies as good as this and that's when i started um you know venturing and looking into brownie recipes mm-hmm. um to basically feel my cravings for mrs fields brownies and then my mother had this uh, cookbook uh, for cakes. Mm-hmm. And um, in that cookbook, there was a recipe for brownies. Mm-hmm. And I tried it. And that has been our recipe ever since <laughs> for our brownies. All right. Yeah. So so you managed to get this Mrs. Fields brownie. That's kind of your inspiration on how you got into mm-hmm. one thing to bake. Mm-hmm. So, how did it go from here I am trying to replicate Mrs. Fields brownies to hey, let's start a business lah. So, how, how, how did that transition? Well, it didn't come from me personally, mm. that's for sure. Because when I baked it mm. and of course I had to share it with my family members mm. and everyone around me and they came back to me and gave me really good and positive feedback mm. and most of them were like you should start selling this. This mm. is really good. Mm. Yeah. 
So basically, that's how it is. I didn't want to in the beginning. I was like, can I just bake this for free? Like, I love it. I love it because, you know, I love it. And I want to share that love with everyone because I love, you know, when, when, when you cook mm. or when you bake and you, you, you share it with people and they give, and they give such good feedback that mm. just fills you up. Yep, yep. So I was like, that's enough for me. You know, I don't need money. <laughs> no amount of money can, 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 can bring in that kind of happiness, you know. But, but they were like, no, you should, you should. You can, you can really go far with this. And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? Uh, so it was the family support, friends support, yeah. giving you this like, positive feedback. And then how did you start the business? Like, you know, you, do you remember how you like, okay, I'm going to start to commercialize my passion. How did that start? That started with um, my husband, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> my husband and his uh, mom, um, they were like, yeah, so a lot of people have been telling me, like, you should really sell this. And um, like I said in the beginning, I didn't want to, but they, uh, because my husband and his family are like mm. business minded they're from the business background uh. yeah so they were like try it out and my husband helped me out with that you know we went on facebook we went on instagram mm. and then word of mouth from our friends as well mm. and that's basically how it started okay yeah. okay okay so you had the passion you had the know-how you know mm -hmm. the husband was kind of the brains of the entrepreneurial side of the business mm -hmm. and then you grew yep, right that's so right. tell me a little bit about brina bakes like you know what what are the products that you have on offer? What are your top sellers? You know, what makes you Brina Bakes, you know? Okay, well, Brina Bakes is a home-based bakery. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, from the, all the stories that you've heard, it's it inspired from, you know, my childhood. And uh, our current top seller is, I would say, is our brownie. Oh, it's your brownie. Till this very day, it's our brownie. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I'm and I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do try to venture into other desserts as well. Mm -hmm. And that has been going great. You know, like our red velvet cakes, mm -hmm. our carrot cakes, mm -hmm. and also our burnt cheesecake. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm 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 obsessed with that personally. <laughs> burnt cheesecake. I mean, I'm not a huge cheesecake fan, but there's one burnt cheesecake I like. Have you tried the one in Birch or not? DC Mall No I have not Okay Take some time Birch mm -hmm. DC Mall mm -hmm. To die for Hey Birch You can sponsor me huh? <laughs> Can I'll put here Okay I'll check them out too Okay so So the brownie Is still the top seller That's true Um, Now Here's the question right How do you manage Your time I mean here you are Working one passion mm -hmm. You know A kindergarten teacher and also running this home bakery how, how, how do you manage both parts of your life I guess I'm able to do that because my job as an educator is is basically a half day job mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I get off at 3 mm. and then I come home mm. and then if there are orders on that day I'd start baking and preparing uh, okay, yeah. okay. so usually to manage that as well we also have you know, we we tell customers that we need two days uh, orders in advance mm -hmm. at least so mm -hmm. that, you know, we have time to prepare the ingredients and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then we also prepare our materials at hand before the day of the baking begins as well. Yeah. All right. So you have your set items for people to order, like, you know, the brownies mm -hmm. and stuff, right? So... Do you do custom orders as well or are you focusing on, you know, what are the things that you're good at? We focus on things that we're good at, mm -hmm, but at mm -hmm. the same time, we also take in custom orders as well, mm -hmm, of course, because, mm -hmm. you know, we want to please our customers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. yeah. So being a home baker, um, let's talk about in terms of how you market yourself. You mentioned that you're, you're a lot on uh, Facebook and mm -hmm. Instagram. You know, how successful have these things been in terms of driving your business? And, you know, I mean, everyone talks about the big word, let's go viral, you know. You got any plans on how do you want to go viral and things like that? Um, So far, to be honest, not really. <laughs> <laughs> because if I were to go viral, if we were to go viral, I don't think I have enough time 
on my hands to do both uh. you know being an educator and also um, a baker you know mm. you, you gotta choose either or yeah so that has never really been my plan uh, I okay yeah. I get it so you, you still want to do this as a home baking business that's true just monetize the passion a little bit that's right? true okay so here's here's another question so the world that we live in right now mm-hmm. is so health conscious that's everyone true. talks about oh I need a diet oh I'm gluten free oh you know this sugar vegan whatever right mm-hmm. now how has that impacted you as a baker uh, and what do you do to try to catch those trends or to help serve your customers who are into those types mm. of food? Of course. I mean, I myself am, am also conscious mm. of my diet habits and whatnot. I mean, yeah, funny enough, right? Coming from a sweet tooth. <laughs> but yeah, as you grow older, you realize that you need to really be mindful of what you put into your body, right? Mm. And being a baker is is it, it goes against that idea as well. But um, I do get customers who have special requests for special ingredients, you know, like gluten free or egg free and stuff like that, mm. or or even customers who are allergic to certain ingredients like nuts and mm. stuff. So I try my very best to accommodate to that we still do accommodate that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we want to be as versatile as we can you know Mm -hmm. we don't want to be just that typical baker that does the you know the normal sugar high baked baked goods yeah okay so here's the thing right i'm a foodie Mm-hmm. As you can see from my size, right? It's not easy to maintain this size, I tell you. Huh? <laughs> so, the question that I always have is, like, on a taste perspective, mm-hmm. when you start making things sugar-free, gluten-free, how, how do you try to match the taste of the real thing? Is mm. that something that you can do? Um, I mean, I'm pretty new. In, we're pretty new into that. Mm-hmm. When, we, when we get these sort of, like, special requests... Mm-hmm. We do test it out uh, at first, test out the recipe at first, and uh, it does, you know, it does have a slight difference. Mm -hmm. For example, if you want, uh, I've I've done a gluten-free chocolate cake. Mm. It's not as moist or as rich as the regular chocolate cake that we make. So it's a texture thing. Yeah, it's the texture Mm. and also the taste, I would say. Okay. Yeah. But I guess, um, you know, because we're really, we're still new in in that area, mm-hmm. mm, we, you know, we're still experimenting, mm-hmm. we're still looking mm-hmm. for more recipes that can actually match to the real and regular cake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, seeing that you're doing all this, a few of these custom orders, right? Mm-hmm. What's the weirdest request or weirdest order that you've ever had? Weirdest? Mm, weirdest. I wouldn't say it's weird. Mm. You know how like people are, when people are getting married, they have bachelor and bachelorette parties. Okay, is this is this something we can share with the public? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I understand now. So so yes. to put it specific, um, in in a nice way, it would be <laughs> phallic shaped, um, object. Ob- mm. Yeah, phallic shaped desserts, lah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right, yeah. Still a family show, huh? <laughs> I'm not being demonetized. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. so you get you get that quite a bit as well. Yeah, we do. <laughs> We're actually a lot of custom. A lot of our customers actually come back to us mm. with that request. Okay. Yeah, and then I've been having fun making <laughs> you know those phallic shakes. <laughs> <laughs> so so here's the other question, right? Being a home baker is very different from running an industrial baker, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'm assuming the equipment you use are still home-based equipments or are you using some sort of a semi-industrial grade uh, ovens and things like that? I would say our oven is semi-industrial. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, we have our mixers, standard mixers that you can find mm. in a home as well. Mm, mm. Uh, we have a few utensils every you know every now and then we 
tend to upgrade our mm. utensils, mm. you mm. know, as we grow, as our number of orders grow and and the different type of orders come in, so you need different types of utensils for it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we we I want to say collect. Yeah, we collect different utensils, different pans and stuff. Yeah. S so, what's what's the biggest challenge that mm -hmm. you have as a home baker? I would say the space. Ah. Yeah. Because currently we we bake in my in-laws house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so in her little kitchen. <laughs> ah, so that that's the challenge lah. Yeah, I would say. Okay, but the space. But talking about we go back to your aspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you're saying you still want to do what you're doing on a career perspective and at mm -hmm. the same time you still want to manage this home baker business. Mm -hmm. Now, if this home baker business grows to the next level, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm assuming you'll cross that bridge when you get there or do you have any future aspirations if one day Brina Bakes becomes the next big thing? That's the thing. I've been in such a dilemma thinking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. these two because a lot of people around me have been asking that specific question as well mm -hmm. and I've mm -hmm. been asking myself too. Mm -hmm. um, so far, we haven't come to an answer yet yeah. but... I think if push comes to shove, mm. I would definitely go for the baking yeah. business. Yeah, I mean you can, I mean you can. Like I said, you I can see the chocolate fudge coming from the <laughs> pores. You know, I mean you 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 speak about the business with so much a passion. So when we talk about your entire mix of products, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say the brownies are like about sixty percent of the sales? You know, or is it a good mix with the other products? Mm, I would say you're about right. Mm. Yeah, the brownies. Uh, because we now supply to cafes as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like when you say cafes, like um, office cafes, school cafeterias, that kind of thing? Or? No, like cafes. Oh, cafe, ca like coffee, coffee, like coffee shops. Yeah, got it, yeah got it, got that's it, got right. It. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So uh, where can we get your products? Any cafes that you can plug out there? Um, currently, uh, we're supplying to Coffee Cartel in Tamanton. Okay. And okay. also Sprezzo Coffee. Okay. Um, yeah. What's the price point of your uh, brownies like? Is it uh, 3 for 10? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but unfortunately, that price no longer exists <laughs> in this day and age. Yeah, with inflation and stuff, mm. right? <laughs> but um, I would say we sell our uh original mm. we call it the OG brownie mm. <laughs> it's a plain brownie classic brownie mm. uh, in a 10 inch square size okay. uh, at around 60 ringgit all right 10 inch should be just enough for me la. I'm a one person <laughs> one person meal I think okay it's so about 60 ringgit yeah okay okay so 60% of your sales are the brownies that's your top seller so mm -hmm. that's something that you know I definitely have to try mm -hmm. um, I've actually tried something that you baked uh, I don't know if you remember but it was my son's birthday and you actually baked cream puffs. I don't know if you remember. I do remember. But those cream puffs were to die for, dude. I mean, I'm not a huge cream puff guy. You know, it's the type that, you know, it's not gelat. Like when you eat, it's just nice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not too mm -hmm. sweet. So I'm looking forward for these brownies, dude. Aww. You know. So let's just say someone out there wants to start their own baking business. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say go for it, number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. You know, don't hesitate because that was me. That was my situation in the beginning. I was hesitating, not knowing how it would turn out. So if you have a passion for it mm -hmm. and if you have the slightest thought for it, just go for it mm -hmm. and um, just keep going. All right. Yeah. Just keep on going, Just you know, follow follow your passions going. and go. That's right. Just right. keep going, keep learning. Awesome. I'm actually a self-taught baker. All right. Yeah, so you can you can learn anything, you know, if you're passionate enough, you can just be whatever you want. So when you say your self thought, was it like YouTube? Was it your mom? Or how? What? What were the influences that you know helped you learn the skills that you needed to be a baker? A bit of everything. A bit of mm, everything mm. and everywhere. Um, definitely started off with my mother. Like mm. I've mentioned, she used to bake mm. a lot mm. when I was growing up. Mm. And um, technique wise or mm. recipe wise, mm. definitely the internet, mm -hmm. Google, mm -hmm. and YouTube are mm. your best friends. Mm are your tools. Mm. 
so yeah that's basically it yeah well i mean uh, i'm a huge fan of a basic butter cake so sabrina you know what to do like <laughs> ah, my birthday in august uh, just, uh, i just hear so you, you know, like. <laughs> all right so um actually i have, I have another question mm-hmm. uh i've always wanted to know this now this might sound boring mm-hmm. but it's interesting to me when it comes to logistics right so here you got you've got an order right mm-hmm. so you're based in kl obviously right um What if you have orders that are outside of KL? Have you ever had orders outside of KL? We have. Okay. As so far as um, Sepang area, okay. Seremban area, yeah. So how do you deliver? I've I've always wanted to know, like, because it's a baking product, you know, it's fragile, and you know, you want to make sure that it reaches fresh to the customer. That's so true. So how how do you manage the logistics of it? Mm, we basically use Lala Move. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the safest way for uh for our desserts mm. to travel is using a car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because mm-hmm. there was this one time we baked uh, a customer ordered cream puffs, mm. and we delivered it by motorcycle, mm. and you know it ended up all over the place. Okay. So yeah, my advice for those who are doing home baking mm. and you want to transport your goods. Use a car. Okay, you heard it here first, right? Trust Lala Move. You know, <laughs> Lala Move. You're a sponsor. I'll put here. So <laughs> everyone, I'll just put your logo here. Okay, Ken, <laughs> just give me a call. All right. So I mean, I'm just speaking to you today, Sabrina. Honestly, I I can see the passion that you have um, in both sides of your life. You know, your 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 day job, mm-hmm. talking about kids. I I see it, right? And the fact that you're running this business. I mean, whilst you have, uh, like you mentioned, your husband helping you with the entrepreneur side of the business, I see the passion in terms of the fact that you not just like baking, you love baking, and you want to transfer that happiness to others as well. I see that, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, it's been it's been a very insightful conversation. So before Thank we you. close, before we close, I've always I've always got a segment right. I've got the fun stuff. Okay, right. so I got to put some fun stuff. Okay. What is it? <laughs> If You could only eat one item from your catalog of products for the rest of your life. What would that item be? For the rest of my life, you only can eat one dessert forever. <sighs> okay, from your catalog that okay. you make, what would it be? Hmm. Oh my! Oh my! <laughs> You're putting me at a tough spot. I want to say. My brownies. It's got to be the OG, dude. Yes. It's got to be the That's OG, true. right? That is true. <laughs> so <laughs> brownies, lah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you know, you got you guys got to order these brownies after this. So, oh, this is funny. <laughs> If you had to design a pastry okay. or a dessert mm-hmm. based on your husband, what would it be? Based on my husband. Mm. Hmm. Interesting question. Let me think. My husband, I would say, a durian-based dessert. Oh, he's a durian kaki lah. Um, not so much on that. I mean, I love durian too, but that's the thing because, not to say that I love him like how I love my <laughs> durian, but like you know how you know how, not everyone loves durian. It's it's sort of like an acquired taste as well. So, your husband is an acquired taste. Yeah, I suppose you know, like, <laughs> like there are times where you love him, and there are times where you just wanna throw in the trash. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> to my wife, uh, I think you can relate to that. Also, <laughs> I get it. You know, I thought I thought you're gonna go. You know, he's hard on the outside, Aww. spiky, but inside he's soft and sweet. I mean, if if we can read a session, yeah, you can. <laughs> You can say it that way too. Yeah, yeah, sure. It got, applies that way. I got as well. your back, bro. I got <laughs> your back. <laughs> All right. Now, if you were stuck, if you were stuck in a deserted island, mm-hmm. right, and you could only bring three people with you in this island, let's say, who would they be and why? Hmm. Like profession-wise, or my family members? Doesn't matter. Doesn't family? matter. Who who would it be like for survivability? Okay, here you are in this island. You need to survive, and only three people you can have with you. Who would they be? My husband, of course. Oh, <laughs> you guys. Um, a doctor, I guess, to keep me yeah, 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 healthy. Yeah, makes sense. And um, a baker to make sure that I have my sweets <laughs> all the time. Aren't you the baker? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're on you're on an island. You don't have all the recipes in your mind, and there's no internet connection. So you know, I've asked I've asked this question to a few guests, lah. Mm-hmm. The best answer, 
is Bear Grylls. That's all you need. You know who Bear Grylls is? Oh, yeah, yes, Bear yes, yes. Su- that dude. The, the survivalist. That, yeah. I don't need three people. I need one. Bear Grylls. I'm true. done. I'm that done. is so true. Oh my. Should okay. have thought of that. So let's just say if I was to take your handphone right now, right, and mm-hmm. I turn on your Spotify or Apple Music or whatever music provider that you use, mm-hmm. what are the three top songs or bands on your playlist? Number one has got to be Caesar. Yo yo. <laughs> yeah, Caesar. Um, The Weekend. These young people, okay. <laughs> and also, uh, what's her name? Kaliuchis. Okay, so you so. R&B, hip hop. That's that's kind of your jam. Yep, that's true. All right. So um, okay, this. So I I ask this in every single session. Okay. Mm-hmm. What are the three best things for you to eat, and where can we get them? Ooh. Um. Uh, three best. Three best. Okay. Best noodles. Mm. UI segambut. Oh, dude. I get you. Okay, UI, right? Tom yum, clear or curry? Which one? Curry for sure. Tom oh yum my god, I life. could drink Tom that yum curry for, like, for days. Okay, this UI noodles. <laughs> again, I'm, I'm significantly older than you. Uh, <laughs> it used to be about 12 to 13 ringgit a bowl when I started mm-hmm, eating mm-hmm. it. Yeah, but tried to add another 10 dollars, oh and now it's about god, 25 ringgit, dude. Right. Yeah, 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 oh okay. my god. Okay, UI segambo. So UI segambo. I got it. Okay, so number two. Hmm. This new Korean restaurant in Tropicana Gardens. Uh, if you love Korean food, I wasn't a bit Korean foodie, but mm. when I went to this place called The Fire at okay. Tropicana Garden Mall, mm. mm-hmm. um, I tried the fire chicken bulldog, mm. and it was something that I imagined. Like when I see pictures, because I've, you know how like back then Samyang was like a trend, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and but but it costs so much you mm. know like five ringgit a pack so I was mm. like no I'm not gonna buy that mm. it's an instant noodle mm. but I've always wanted to try it because mm. I love spicy food as well mm. and 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 when I finally get to try this bulldog noodle I fell in love with it instantly because it's everything that I've ever imagined I was like oh it's tasty all right yeah so this b- bull chick fire chicken fire bulldog. chicken bulldog I guess that's how you pronounce okay, it okay 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 <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong and number three <laughs> And uh, number three would be, hmm, <laughs> something yummy, you know that you just, you know, you'll do anything just to get this in your mouth. Where was you know? it? Oh my god, I have a list in my mind, but now it's gone. That now that I'm put on spot, where is it? Be? Don't tell me it's another noodle. Is it another noodle? Hmm? No, it's not. It's not really a noodle. It's um, sukiya. It's Japanese. Yeah, I guess it's Japanese. Oh, it's it's, it's like it's the shabu shabu action. Yeah, shabu shabu. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, that's right. Okay, okay. I'm a I'm I'm a huge hot pot guy. That's I mean, right. Steamboat is the best, and the OG of Steamboats is Johnny's. I mean, oh. if you guys are Johnny's, that's OG. My husband's favorite, yeah. but I love Sukiya. Sukiya right. is the best. Okay, honestly, um, you know what, Sabrina, thank you so much for making time for this thank podcast. You. I think uh, I learned a little bit more about you, uh, about your business. You know what drives you, what motivates you, and you know the fact that you also like UI Segambo. I mean, <laughs> again, I'm open for sponsorships. I'll, I will eat one bowl. You give me ten percent discount, also okay. And I'll join you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, there you have it, guys. Uh, here we have another episode of Find the Real, where I believe everyone has a story. Uh, thank you for listening in. But before we sign out. Sabrina, is there any way for the listeners out there to be able to connect with you if they want to make some orders or just to you know know a little bit about you? How how can they connect with you? Of course, you can always hit us up on Facebook and Instagram at Sabrina Bakes KL, and ten percent off on your first orders. Oh, nice, dude! All right, thank you, and <laughs> I'll catch you guys on the next episode. Peace. Bye.